Section 1 of Monologues. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Monologues by Richard Middleton. The Decay of the Essay. Owing to the general laxity with which men and women use the language they inherit, in the course of years words are apt to be broadened and coarsened in their meaning. Striving against this tendency, every scrupulous writer is in danger of robbing words of a part of their birthright. Through fear of letting them mean too much, he makes them mean too little. Ultimately, of course, the popular meaning prevails, and we suck our fountain pens in vain who seek to preserve a kind of verbal aristocracy. But it is a pleasant game while it lasts, and it does no one any harm. For instance, there is this word, essay. It is used today loosely to mean almost any kind of prose article, especially when such articles are rescued from periodical literature and reprinted in book form. Mr. Chesterton's twisted allegories are essays, and so are Mr. Lucas's pleasant pilferings from queer books and Mr. Shaw's dramatic criticisms. So, too, for that matter, are Earle's characters and the Roger de Coverley papers, and Swinburne's laudations of the Elizabethan dramatists. Confronted with this embarrassing promiscuity, the critic who really wishes the word essay to mean something is forced to give it a purely arbitrary meaning, and this I have ventured to do in choosing a title for my lament. To say that the art of writing little articles for the newspapers and republishing them in modest volumes is decaying would be absurd, but to say that at the present time very few people are trying to write like Charles Lamb is patently true. To me, essays are such leisurely expressions of a humane and agreeable personality as we find in the works of Elia. They may criticize and rhapsodize and narrate, but the reader is always conscious of the individuality that controls the pen. A fit medium of expression for tranquil minds, they reveal with a careless generosity the mind emotions and placid processes of thought that give them birth. The delicately flattered reader feels that the essayist is guarding no Bluebeard's chamber of the mind. As far as the hospitable writer has himself explored it, so far are its dim corridors open to his inquiring eyes. For, of all forms of artistic expression, this is the most personal and self-revealing. It might be described as the art of expression in dressing gown and carpet slippers. A bad man, if there be any bad men, might endeavor to express a moment of his criminal life in a sonnet or a short story or a romance. But he would, I hope, think too highly of humanity in general to seek to reflect it in his own lost person. Yet this is the work of the essayist. These, I fear, he says with spirit, are my meannesses, my weaknesses, my vices. But on the other hand, I have, I think, these trivial virtues. Perhaps there are other men like me. No bad man could write like that. He would rather believe himself unique in his villainy. And this brings me to the quality that leads men to write essays. Being men of leisurely mind, it might naturally be presumed that they would be satisfied with dreaming and that they would leave the drudgery of writing to men of action. But it is apparent to me that the true essayist is a man troubled with a great loneliness. He finds, doubtless, being a generous lover of his fellows, a number of acquaintances who share and even surpass his own special virtues. But he cannot discover in his personal environment those rarer beings who should also disclose his own delicate vices. And these are the men above all others with whom he wishes to come in contact. So he takes pen and paper, and setting down his faults and his merits with a high fairness, stretches, as it were, a pair of appealing hands to his comrades in the world. This habit of analyzing his own weaknesses gives him an introspective turn of mind. He is always lying in wait to catch himself tripping. But he would not have you ignore the other side of his character. He wishes to be fair to himself and honorable to you. He prepares a kind of balance sheet for judgment day, and he is above all things anxious that it should be correct. His heart to use a worthily hackneyed phrase, is in his work, and he appoints humanity 
his auditor. Essays are written by leisurely men for leisurely readers. You cannot read Lamb as you read a romance, passionately, tearing the pages. The words flow smoothly across the printed pages, and you drift comfortably with the current, pausing here and there, as doubtless Lamb paused in the writing, to dream in some twilight backwater of thought. The nominal purpose of the voyage may be trifling, but its true purpose is as splendid as all high human endeavor. We do not really dare the great adventure in order to see Charles Lamb dreaming over the crackling of roast pork, or Mr. Max beer boom in rapt contemplation of his hat box. Our autumn has its pork, and we, too, have our hat boxes. We set out, like all great explorers, in search of ourselves and our common sense tells us that we are most likely to get authentic news of our destination from the intellectual honesty of the essayists. Theirs is the seasoned wisdom and ripe authority of old travelers, and we realize in reading their log-books that our road does not differ greatly from theirs. Perhaps at the end of the journey we shall know that all roads are one. I suppose that, using the word essay in the restricted sense I have suggested, the great essayist might easily be numbered on a baby's toes. And as one of them still flourishes, the decay that has overtaken this form of expression may not be immediately obvious. But in the past there has always been a host of minor essayists, writers who might not achieve a great partnership between their hearts and their pens, but who did agreeable work nevertheless, and it is the absence of these minor writers of essays from the number of our modern authors that alarms me. It is true that we have our Charles Lamb, but I look in vain for our Lay Hunt, nor can we let ourselves be put off with some of the very able work that appears in periodicals and has the shape and length and general outward appearance of real essays. Journalism is growing more impersonal, though by no means less egoistic, and you may search the writings even of our individual journalists such as Mr. Chesterton and Mr. Lucas, Mr. Benson and Mr. Belloc, in vain for a decent confession of personal weaknesses. It is true that they set down their petty private vices. No one who even pretends to write essays can help doing that. But they make them appear either humorously criminal, or like so many virtues in disguise, and we have seen that your true essayist is neither a sinner nor a saint, but just a common man like his readers. So while we who are ashamed of the skeletons in our waistcoat pockets may read the writings of these gentlemen for their wit and cleverness, we will continue to turn to Lamb and Montaigne for sympathy and advice. They will bring us to the place where dreams blend with realities, and action puts on the gentle gown of thought. The fact is that essays are bad journalism in the literal sense of that elastic word because they take no count of time. While it is the function of journalism to tear the heart out of today, a good essay should start and end in a moment as long as eternity. It should have the apparent aimlessness of life, and, like life, it should have its secret purpose. Perhaps the perfect essay would take exactly a lifetime to write, and exactly a lifetime to comprehend. But in their essence, essays, I cling to my restricted sense of the word, ignore time, and even negate it. They cannot be read in railway trains by travelers who intend to get out at a certain station, for the mere thought of a settled destination will prevent the reader from achieving the proper leisurely frame of mind. Nor can they be written for a livelihood, for a man who sits down to write an essay should be careless as to whether his task shall ever be finished or not. It may be said confidently that few persons write like this today. It may even be objected by sticklers for accuracy in titles that few persons have ever written like this, and I am willing to agree. But the essayist whom I have described is the perfect type, that ideal which less gifted men can only pursue to the brink of their graves. And while in some measure this was always the ideal of periodical writers in the past, it certainly is in no wise the ideal of the journalists of today. They do not wish to write sympathetically of themselves. They cannot linger with leisurely trains of thought. Breathless assurance, dogmatic knowledge, and a profusion of capital wheeze 
help them to sing their realization of the glories of today, their passionate belief in the future, their indifferent contempt for the past. These are, they tell us, days of action, and dreamers can have but short shrift in a common-sense world. Probably this is true, but I notice that the literature of action does not make its readers very comfortable. Men and women are growing weary-eyed these days, and their feet stumble like those of tired runners. Their voices are growing hoarse from shouting energetic prophecies into the deaf ears of the future, and their hands are sore from their unending task of holding the round earth in its place. They cannot dream because they will not allow themselves to sleep. It may be morbid, but I sometimes think that I can detect a note of wistfulness in the eyes of my neighbors in life when they let them stray from their newspapers to rest for a moment on the leaves of my book. Once I discovered a tear on the cheek of a clerk in the city, and I taxed him with this mark of treachery to the life of action, but he assured me that his sorrow was due to the low price of consuls. It may have been, I do not know, but one of these days our journalists will have to stop to take breath, and in the universal holiday perhaps some of their readers will have time to write essays. End of section one. Section 2 of Monologues. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Monologues by Richard Middleton. The Tyranny of the Ugly. When a young man first awakens to a sense of the beauty and value of life, it is natural that he should be overwhelmed by the ugliness of the inheritance that his ancestors have forced upon him. He finds in the civilization that he has had no place in devising a tyranny against which it appears almost impossible to make any resistance, a dogma which he is told everyone except a young fool must accept as a truth, a law the breaking of which will number him beyond redemption among the criminal or the insane. It may be that, in the first joy of his appreciation of the beautiful, he will think that his life and the life of any man may best be passed in the cultivation of a keener sense of beauty, that, to put it in concrete form, it is better to grow and love roses in a cottage garden than to reign in an umbrella factory. But this briefest of the illusions of youth will be shattered forthwith by what appears to be the first law of civilized life that a man can only earn his living by the manufacture of ugliness. It is probable that in his bitterness the young man will turn for comfort to those latter-day prophets and philosophers whose wisdom perhaps may have solved a problem which seems to him beyond hope, but he will certainly be disappointed. On the one hand, he will find the wise men of the day devising schemes for the proper management and control of umbrella factories with a view to the greatest public good. On the other, he will find them sighing for the roses of medievalism, or proving by ingenious paradox that clear vision can find the Middle Ages even now in the lesser streets of Balaam. For our prophets and our philosophers have forgotten that they were ever young, and with the passing years their ideal world has become a sort of placid almshouse, free from drafts and disturbances a place where the aged and infirm can sit at ease and scheme little revolutions on a sound conservative basis, without any jarring note of laughter or discord of the hot blood of the young. And so the young man must turn to the poets and find what comfort he may in the knowledge that there are others who have felt and feel even as he, that there are others who have wondered whether the best of a man's life should be spent in paying for the blotting out of nature with unsightly lumps of brick and steel, in aiding in the manufacture of necessaries that are not necessary, in repeating stupidly the ugly crimes of yesterday in order to crush the spirit of his children and his children's children. Of course, it may be said that this love of beauty on the part of a young man is morbid and unnatural, 
and the just consequence of an unwise or defiant education for civilization with a somewhat ignoble cunning has guarded against possible treachery on the part of her children by causing them to be taught only such things as may lead them to her willing service it is unnecessary to point out that the dangerous revolutionary spirit which worships lovely things is not encouraged in our national schools the children of the state are taught to cut up flowers and to call the fragments by cunning names but they are not invited to love them for their beauty they can draw you a map of the railway line from fishguard to london and prattle glibly of imports and exports and the populations of distant countries but they know nothing of the natural beauties of the places they name nor even of such claims as there are in the city in which they live their lips lisp dates and the dry husks of history but they have no knowledge of the splendid pageant of bygone kingdoms and dead races nor in our public life which might better be named our public death is there shown any greater regard for the spiritual side of the parents than there is for that of the children heedless of the advice of artists the ignorant and uncultured men whom ambition alone has placed in a responsible position will ruin the design of a street for the sake of a few pieces of silver and for the fear that the spending of public money on making london beautiful may endanger their seats at the next election with honest electors who have learnt their lesson of ugliness only too well the cheaper newspapers which alone are read by the people as a whole seek out and dilate on ugliness with passionate ingenuity and even those papers which appear to be read by the more leisured classes find no disgrace in filling five columns with the account of a bestial murder and in compressing the speech of a great man of letters into a meagre five lines where then can a young man seek for beauty in the life of to-day only as i have said above in literature and only there because the mere writing of a book is not sufficient to make it a contribution to literature if it be not at the same time an expression of that beauty of life which is in spite of our rulers eternal for there are ugly books enough and there are a multitude of ugly writers to swell their numbers but our critics when they are honest can render their labors vain and though there is an outcry in the camps of the ugly when such a critic has spoken his daring word the word has been spoken and the book is dismissed to the shelves of the folk who care for such trash but our critics must be honest end of section two section three of monologues this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org monologues by richard middleton the true bohemia it is not too much to say that in the view of ordinary persons bohemianism is a pose and moreover a very troublesome pose they see that as a class bohemians are careless in their dress eccentric in their morals and fonder of literature than seems proper to reasonable folk and not content with being annoyed they conclude with a natural but hardly intelligent egoism that this neglect of the conventions on the part of the natives of bohemia is adopted solely for the purpose of annoying aliens this error which does not prevail among unintellectual people alone were pardonable if the sedate did not immediately conclude that this pose is itself bohemianism and that therefore if you could make a bohemian put on a clean collar discard his library of poets and attend a series of salvationist meetings you would at once change him to a respectable ratepayer with a sitting in a chapel and a decent villa in a decent back street of philistia in a word they confuse the external manifestations of the bohemian spirit with that spirit itself it must be a matter of regret to every one who has the bohemian interests at heart that stevenson never wrote an essay on the subject his sympathy and admiration for youth exactly qualified him for the task and as it is i believe it to be possible to state the bohemian position very well by quoting from his books always self-conscious he never wrote about youth without casting a forgiving eye on his own 
which was, in spite of his weak health and the shorter catechism, essentially that of a bohemian. And it was, therefore, to his writings that I turned in my search for a definition. Youth, he writes somewhere, taking fortune by the beard demands joy like a right. And the essay entitled Crabbed Age and Youth, in Virginibus Puerisque, is a spirited defense of those illogical enthusiasms that are so dear to bohemians and so much condemned in any man youth is the time to go flashing from one end of the world to the other both in mind and body to try the manners of different nations to hear the chimes at midnight to see sunrise in town and country to be converted at a revival to circumnavigate the metaphysics write halting verses run a mile to see a girl and wait all day long at the theatre to see ernani i feel that these two quotations contain the root of the matter and i would venture to suggest that the bohemian is the man who demands joy most passionately whose enthusiasms are least logical, in fact, that the bohemian spirit is the quintessence of youthfulness. Thence follows, as a matter of course, the acceptance of the motto, Life for Life's Sake. That effort to obtain from every moment of existence a perfect expression of life, which stirs the bohemian to a constant sense of his own vitality, and lends to his most trivial actions an air of consciousness so manifest that they must needs be interpreted by the sleepers and the half-dead as fragments of an indecently scornful pose. Full of a sense that he is making history for his old age, he tastes life as a man tastes wine, and he mixes his drinks, so that if you see him roistering in a tavern today, you may depend upon it, he will be reading fairy stories to a nursery full of babies tomorrow. Of course, the charge of selfishness may be brought against this ideal of bohemia just as it has been brought against every ideal that man's heart has ever coveted but it must be allowed that the bohemian has certain very definite and admirable human qualities in a marked degree he loves to make sacrifices though as may be said of others besides bohemians he had perhaps rather do good to his neighbor than that his neighbor should be done good to he has a passionate fondness for beauty and an aptitude for discovering it in unlikely places finding how often the things he likes himself are condemned he achieves a youthful tolerance only lacking in discrimination and having regard to this tolerance every honest intelligent young man ought to be thus far a bohemian for he can condemn nothing of knowledge but only of impulse and of all things he should hate intellectual priggishness most the experience will come, and he must drop out of the number of the elect, but he has won his spurs, and the glamour of his genial knighthood will be with him forever. And, indeed, it were wise if, as our promising youths were once wont to make the grand tour before settling down to the business of life, they were now, one and all, to visit this bitter-sweet country of Bohemia. Sweet because it is the ultimate expression of youth. Bitter because like youth itself it is evanescent for as a reformed spendthrift makes the best of misers so a man who once upon a time has lived ten years of his life in one eager year may be trusted to exercise a just discretion in the difficult matter of living ever after and further bohemia is a school in which a man can supply those parts of learning which his more formal education will not have touched he may learn here the merits and defects of excess, the critical value of laughter, the breadth and glory of the country we call life, the cheerful habit of open speech, the joys of comradeship, and the necessity of examining a convention before accepting it, even if his great-grandfather has tried it and found it good before him. He will become wise in drink, careless in tobacco, and tolerant of bad food, if only it be cheap. From hearing unknown poets recite their own verses, he will learn that there is a wealth of unpublished poetry in the land, that there are other men besides himself and the handful of poets in Who's Who for whom life is a beautiful story even if it have no moral. And perhaps most necessary of all, he will come to believe that knowledge itself is of small account, but that in the power to learn lies the strength of a man's mind. 
perhaps not all the bohemians with whom he may come in contact will be to his liking for here as elsewhere you will find charlatans since the one vice undreamed of in bohemia is shrewdness and the inhabitants fall an easy prey for a time but a state which demands constant sacrifices of its children cannot content knaves long and they soon scuttle back to their kin with pocket-books stuffed with lies and an air of happy escape then too the saddest thing in all bohemia the old bohemians the peter pans who will not grow up may disturb his peace of mind for a while with their reckless jollity and their air of great opportunities wantonly missed but so benign a spirit does bohemia inspire in its patriots that it is quite probable that they will lead him aside and warn him against permitting his adventures to become habits with pointed references to their own lives and on the whole he will spend the happiest time in his life he may be in london or paris or belfast it does not matter where for bohemia exists where bohemians are and cafes or suburbs have as little to do with the true bohemian spirit as untidy clothes and neglected barbers of course unless he is one man out of a hundred the splendid vision will pass and he will find himself facing civilization itself in the end but by then he will be equipped with all those weapons of wisdom and tolerance that bohemia provides for its knights nor shall he lose the old faith and the old wonder though time has proved that the life he sought so eagerly was itself a dream yes for all save the unfortunate it must pass and yet as i sit in my castle in bohemia and write these lines i hear the songs of the citizens rising from the street and their laughter echoing among the housetops and i dread the day when my palaces shall change to factories and my domes to chimneys and i shall be able to see the truth no more end of section three Section 4 of Monologues. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Monologues by Richard Middleton. Dreaming as an Art. It is sometimes pleasant, when the facts of life begin to annoy us, to remember that we are only dreamers in a world of dreams our dreams are no less real to our minds than our waking adventures and it is only chance that has led us to exaggerate the importance of the one at the expense of the other if poets had been of any importance in the earlier days of the world we might easily have come to consider our waking life as a pleasant period of rest for the emotions while cultivating our dream pastures till their roses became like crimson domes and their lilies like silver towers under the stars but the hard-headed men, who could throw brickbats farther than their neighbors, had, I presume, the ordering of events in those far dim days, and therefore today we all believe in tables and scoff at ghosts. We enjoy smoking-room stories and yawn at dreams. I might also have added that we knight the throwers of the brickbats and starve the majority of the poets, but I would be the last to deny the justice of this arrangement. For if the former class has taken the daylight earth to itself, the poet holds in their treasuries the title deeds of the fertile pastures and purple mountains of sleep. I know who is the richer. And if our dreams pass with the morning, it is no less true that our realities pass with the coming of sleep. We see a man fall asleep in a railway carriage, and our illusory faculties tell us that he is still there, while he himself, who should surely know, is only too well aware that he is being chased by a mad white bull across the Bay of Biscay. Probably he will return to the railway carriage presently, but meanwhile the bull in the blue waters are as true for him as his stertorous body is for us who lament his snoring. And why should we prefer our impression to his? The point is important because in supporting the claims of the dream world against those of our waking life, it is necessary to meet the case of the man who says, I should soon come to grief if I look to dreaming. As a matter of fact, and this throws some light on the life histories of our poets, it seems impossible to be successful in both worlds. We all know the earthly troubles that overtake dreamers, 
and I am willing to wager that your Jew millionaire goes bankrupt half a dozen times a night in his sleep, where all his yellow money cannot save him. Probably, if you cultivate the art of dreaming, you will pay for it under the sun, but whereas our chances on the earth are limited by our opportunities, the lands of sleep are boundless and our holding is only limited by our capacity for dreaming. There are no trusts in dreams. Next, it is necessary to consider how far it is possible to command our dreams at will, and this, I think, is very largely a matter of practice. At first hearing, most people would think a man who said that he could dream when, and to a certain degree, whatever he wanted, untruthful. But the effects of opium on the practiced eater are known to everyone, and cucumber and lobster salads have been calculated in terms of nightmares to a nicety. And while deprecating these more violent stimulants, I am sure that by choosing a judicial daylight environment, the will can be brought to bear almost directly on our midnight adventures. I may refer, in support of this, to the number of instances quoted in Mr. Lang's Book of Dreams and Ghosts of persons solving problems in their sleep which had baffled them when they were awake. To anyone who wishes to dream pleasant, if unoriginal, dreams, I should recommend a life of intellectual rather than emotional idleness. The theater, music, flowers, and novels of a badly written, exciting character are all serviceable for this kind of dreamer, and he or she should cultivate a habit of wandering and incoherent thought. The rest, as I have suggested, is a matter of will, but I warn the unwary that the results are apt to be surprising. For, after all, except possibly in certain cases of insanity, the two worlds overlap but slightly. Usually we can recall a small chapter of the dream we have dreamed, and in our sleep we retain a little of our waking wisdom, and that is all. From the splendid garden in which you wandered last night, you brought away nothing perhaps but a flower or two, broken in waking. Tonight you may be flying about the housetops as if you had never accepted the law of gravity as a fact, and as you may not now recall the laws which govern your kingdom of sleep, you can only suggest a course for your movements therein, at the risk of finding yourself engaged in a series of very uncomfortable adventures. Owing to an effort to dream short stories after the manner of Robert Louis Stevenson, I was compelled to commit two singularly brutal murders touched with a number of lifelike but repellent details. I know better now, for I have learnt that for me it is a rule of sleep that I should take the leading part myself, even though, oddly enough, the dream is still a work of art so far as to allow me to go back and alter incidents which do not fit in with the latter part of the story. I may add that, owing to the extraordinary logic which binds my movements when asleep, the stories are hardly ever any good from a waking point of view. But the dreams are agreeable because I have a subconscious glow of self-congratulation on the vast quantity of work that I am doing. I think it possible that all very lazy people have this glow in their dreams, for this would account for the quite immoral happiness of the habitually idle. Moreover, it constitutes a quite reasonable defense for laziness, for no one can be expected to work all around the clock, and if a prince has been opening imaginary bazaars all night, you cannot ask him to lay real foundation stones all day. We can, and do, punish men for preferring their labors in the other world to their labors in this, but we have no right to call them foolish as well as criminal. Rebels against the conventional must be corrected to satisfy the majority that it is right, but it is narrow-minded to despise them. They may be tyrants in the dim places where dreams are born. And this brings me to the whole moral aspect of dreams and dreaming, a point on which I would gladly write a complete article. It has often been noticed that in dreams we have no sense of right or wrong, but as we have also no control over our actions, it would seem that it would not make much difference if we had that sense. Our movements appear to be guided by a will outside our own bodies, and to a certain extent, at all events, this will is the will of the normal daylight man. It is quite possible to regard our dreams as a kind of dramatic commentary on our waking life, or as an expression of the emotions which the intellect has forced us to suppress in that life. 
if this be so we ourselves are more real in dreams than we are when awake however fantastic or ridiculous those dreams may appear to our conventional minds and if the last art of living is to express ourselves as we are it would seem that the whole duty of man is to dream perhaps when we have at last come to understand ourselves well enough to complete a utopia our unconventional lives will be devoted to a number of simple daily preparations for the full enjoyment of the dim world which i believe we can make as we will and perhaps our true reward for the pains and uncertainties of our little lives is the place where beauty and joy follow desire as the night follows the day end of section four Recorded by Bob Hamilton. Section 5 of Monologues. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Monologues by Richard Middleton. On Facts. Once upon a time, a small boy was appointed to the honorable position of a lift boy in one of those amazing blocks of flats which insult the blue sky from the northern heights of London. One of his duties was calling of cabs, and he was insured with a whistle for that purpose. You blow once for a four-wheeler, twice for a hansom, and three times for a taxi, said his instructor. And if I blow four times, queried the boy who was of an adventurous turn. Ah! replied the man you blow four times for a hearse time passed and while it often fell to the boy's lot to fill the street with the yearning appeals for cabs death must have spared the mansions for the boy was never asked to call a hearse sometimes in fun he would place the whistle to his lips and endeavor to sound the four blasts but his courage always failed him after the third and these adventures would end merely in warlike dialogues with jobbing chauffeurs at length as the boy stood in the street one night whistling vainly for a taxicab a motor-car struck him from behind and as he fell the fatal fourth blast startled the street with its pain and later there came a hearse in the crinoline days this story with a little judicious amendment would have become a translucent tract on the perils that await the disobedient now when we have so much sense it only suggests that if the motorists do not sound their horns they run over adventurous little lift boys but perhaps i may be forgiven if i derive from it the moral that the danger of being dogmatic lies in the fact that other people will probably attach much more importance to our dogmatisms than we do ourselves a man with a fondness for alliteration may pause in a nursery to remark that the fairies of the future will be very fat and then forget about it but it is quite likely that he has left a nightmare of a supernatural fat in the minds of the children, and that their dreams will be disturbed with the visions of loathsome fairies with pantomime paunches and financial chins, so various abhorrent boggles used to make the darkness hideous in our knickerbocker days, while the ingenious Olympians who had invented them went blithely about their pleasures. It is true that as we grow up we cease to accept the purely aesthetic torments, but science is ready with very efficient substitutes. Many unhappy people drag out their wretched lives on wholemeal bread and sterilized milk, breathing but little for fear of microbes, wearing garments of loathsome texture and appearance, while their doctors carouse on lobsters and radishes in dressing gowns of amber silk. A philosopher may be a humbug, and even a justice of the peace may be immoral, but their oratorical wisdom will pass for truth with many and our publicists can pay for their private vices by condemning society for its sins. Of course, men and women accept rules because they appear to make life easier. The doctors tell us that if we get our feet wet, we catch a cold, and we believe them, because we hope that by keeping our feet dry we may be spared this calamity. But, in the interests of their profession, the medical men have chosen a cause which no ingenuity can render uncommon. The really wise man, therefore, would dishonor this rule, and believe that he only caught colds when there was a total eclipse of the sun visible at Greenwich. I am prepared to listen patiently to the learned arguments of my family physician, but in my heart I know that the doctors discover the cure first, and that it is only after the fortunate event that nature moves herself to invent the disease. And if the doctors have afflicted me with neuralgia and hereditary gout, I am well aware that Samuel Smiles has made me lazy, and that certain dim moralists 
have made me vicious i bear these worthies no grudge for assailing my mind in its experienced days and slaying the bold bad rebel before he could stretch his wings Today I wear clothes and eat bacon and eggs for my breakfast, and perhaps one day I shall have villa all of my own on the sunny side of Brixton Road. If they had not told me so many comfortable things, I might, who knows, have eaten honeycomb on the lower slopes of Parnassus. Yet I say that I bear my kindly instructors no grudge. There is a policeman in uniform before my door, and no man may smite me with death before that grim figure and escape punishment and therefore i know that i must not kill those whose politics differ from mine and it is always a comfort in these complex days to know exactly what we may not do i have in mind the picture of a poor law-abiding fellow who dropped dead in regent's park because he found that he had innocently disobeyed a notice which forbade him to walk on the newly sown grass for years and years i suppose he had seen those curt prohibition and never dreamed of questioning their authority i like to think that his last breath was sweetened with the wild sweet wine which tints the lips of rebels and perhaps there is a little envy in the thought for i own that i dare not walk on the grass even by accident in truth this is no paradox for my flesh is so overwhelmed by the value of authority that even though my brain wandered in moonlit gardens my legs would not disobey the london county council it is so easy to do what we are told so hard to forget and begin the business afresh and to make matters complex there is generally some measure of reason in these artificial limitations once on a wall in hampstead i saw written the loveless truth alcohol limits the productive powers of the worker it was i think a fair summer day but my spirit sank at once in a mood of november grayness and omar himself could not stay my sorrow that all our merry nights of wine should end in this the soul of the man who first indicted that bitter truth might rise no more from the dregs and even we who came after were influenced by his penitent morbidity yet on examination the thing proves to be half true alcohol is but one of the thousand emotional stimulants that interfere with our work love flowers the spring winds everything that grows under the skies is in the conspiracy against our absurd labors but the fool i suppose could see nothing but the alcohol in the avoiding of which lay his poor hope of salvation yet he was as reasonable as most dealers in dogma and i see his words in every joyous bottle facts are rules to which the great common sense of the majority will allow no exceptions and the chief end of man would appear to be to impart facts to his neighbor we are even asked to believe that the accumulation of these tiresome limitations is a virtue and their distribution a duty and so there are always anxious persons at our elbow to tell us things which we do not wish to know there is a charming scottish ballad of which the first line runs o oh, wally wally wake up the bank and palgrave informs us gravely that the root of the pronunciation of the word wally are preserved in catterwall only less criminally selfish is the man who tells me the way to camden town and thus robs me of a walk through an enchanted city sometimes looking at the sky on a fine night and remembering how coleridge was able to see a star within the horns of the moon a feat no longer possible to well-informed persons i wonder whether the next intellectual revolution may not be directed against facts their influence on art can only be bad their influence on man may easily be measured in terms of fear i want to blow my whistle four times before i am choked End of section five. Section 6 of Monologues. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Monologues by Richard Middleton. On Knowing London. There are a great many ways of knowing London, and there is something to be said in favor of all of them. There is the way of Walter Besant, who knew medieval London better than his own and found it again in rowan there is the way of mr e v lucas who knows all about people's houses little and big and that of f m hoofer who has threaded the thrills of london on a string like beads then there is the useful man who knows the colours of buses and the characteristic smells of tubes 
and the botanists who can discover window boxes and roof gardens where even the birds may hardly suspect them more frequent is the wise man in taverns and those queer cellars where dim persons play dominoes and drink coffee the specialized topographical knowledge of policemen cabmen and postmen is of a professional character and so is that of the flower girls and the gentlemen who pick up the tips of cigars and cigarettes i suppose the acrobats who mend telephone wires and the man on the monument who lets out telescopes on hire no more about the rooftops than the pavements. Theirs must be a London of hazardous precipices and little still lakes of sooty solitudes and noisy craters. But when the learning of these and a hundred other classes of students has been examined, there remains the interesting problem of the matter in which the normal, unmethodical Londoner is acquainted with his city. He has been often blamed because he does not rush around and see the sights like the rapt American tourist. It has been said, with a great deal of truth, that he does not visit the Tower of London or Westminster Abbey or the British Museum. Yet, when a cab horse lies down in the Strand, a thing that happens every day, the police must work hard to prevent a crowd of eager spectators from blocking the street. At first sight, this seems blameworthy. And yet, in truth, a cab horse reposing in the Strand is more representative of modern London than all her public buildings, and possibly Londoners subconsciously realize this. Strangers are naturally anxious to see the things that make our city a fine city. But we who call it home are hungry for the things that make our city London. We have seen cathedrals and museums and picture galleries in other places, but our crowds and our policemen and our cab horses are ours alone it is this familiarity with what may be called the essential details of london life that constitutes the civic knowledge of nine londoners out of ten and the guide-book wisdom of a foreigner can hardly hope to rival our subtleties he may know the mummies of the british museum very well but the pigeons at its gates are our brothers and not his he may speak legendarily of the great fire and christopher wren but he has not dropped orange pips from the top of the monument as a child he may regard the embankment monolith with a mind attuned to hieroglyphs but he cannot know the children of the pavement call it clara patrick's needle yet it is these things or the like that we call to mind when we think of london now and again it would seem london takes her infants by the hand and it is in these rare moments that we arrive at our finer knowledge of her ways it is something to have seen the great panorama unroll itself from Hampstead Hill. It is something to have steamed from Putney to Southend on a straining tug. But for some the lights of Euston Road and fog, for others perhaps the uneasy flicker of winter dawn on the flowers at Covent Garden, hold more of London than it all. And so this intimate knowledge of their city, common to all true Londoners, become individual in its direct expression i remember a london shopkeeper miserably convalescent at hastings who showed me an old county council tram car that was used by the fishermen for storing their nets on the beach and there were tears in his eyes because it still bore the soft names of beloved southern suburbs and though my heart was in the north with euston and hampstead and camden town i gave him my sympathy freely he told me that he liked the smell of orange peel and was sorry that the custom of eating the golden fruit in the galleries of theatres was dying out though his tram car had failed to appeal me there was something in that to make me homesick i too had loved the smell of oranges and in answering his recollection saw farringdon market drift out along the beach and the light of the naphtha flares pass in smoke to the sea but why had i no school books it takes more than oranges and tram cars to give definition to the picture we have drawn on our slates these things might conceivably represent manchester to an inhabitant of that city and we are all citizens of london it is rather from certain ecstatic moments that we derive our impressions than from any continuous emotional process thus i have seen an escaped monkey sitting on the head of robert burns in the embankment gardens i have heard a tipsy boy sing so sweetly in the large west end cafe that all the women broke down and cried i have been roused from my sleep by a policeman to find that a neighbouring fire had cracked my bedroom windows i have seen a child blowing soap bubbles in the strand 
and Olympic Americans showing off outside Bloomsbury Hotel. I have seen Mr. Bernard Shaw going westward with his beard of flax, and I have heard Mr. G. K. Chesterton laugh in a quiet street. I have seen the merchants of London gazing with a wild surmise on Mr. Brangwyn's fresco at the Royal Exchange. From these and a thousand other similar moments I have won in some dim way my knowledge of London, and though I may know her longer, I shall not know her better. It is not the number of such spiritual adventures that counts. There is a small boy at Drury Lane Theatre who has had twice as many as I. It is rather the extent to which they affect us. And at an early age, London has ceased to astonish me because I had learned to believe her capable of anything. We who live in London know that she is a city of infinite possibilities. Were a dragon to ramp at Westminster, we might regard the Abbey with a new interest. But it would not affect the bank rate. And, knowing this, we go about our business with a calmness that moves lovers of local patriotism to tears. Yet, we are patriotic when we are not in London. We talk about her kindly on the front at Brighton on windy nights, and the man who said that the Niagara Falls reminded him of the fountains in Trafalgar Square was not untypical of her children. To the alien, I suppose London must remain a kind of scattered museum, full of interesting things not very well arranged. Yet once, at all events, it seemed to me that, to a man newly fallen from Scotland, there had been granted a glimpse of the only London that is really ours. I found him startling the echoes of the Adelphi arches with his laughter, and as he was alone in a place not greatly mirthful, I asked him a reason for his merriment. Oh, I'm just laughing at Glasgow, he said. End of section 6section 7 of monologues this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org monologues by richard middleton the poet and the people a few weeks ago one of the impassioned critics who tell posterity about books in the times literary supplement ventured to rebuke a poet for remarking in his preface that few people take much interest in modern verse. I've lost the cutting which contained this little journalistic jeu d'esprit, and my heart sinks at the thought of searching for it anew in the files of the Times. But I may say that I could not help smiling at the noble ardor of the critic, and sympathizing with the dolorous plaint of the poet. Hardly anyone does take any interest in modern verse. And this may be proved not only by looking at the boots of poets and the penny boxes of second-hand booksellers, but also from the most cursory examination of the columns of the Times itself. Now and again it has printed a political tract in rhyme from the pen of Mr. Kipling, and I have some dim recollection of other political tracts and memorial couplets that have appeared in its columns, but I have never suspected it of any effort to print a poem because it was good. And this lyrical reticence, which it shares with all the other morning papers, is sufficiently suggestive at the present time, when even our most dignified periodicals are fain for that popularity which has so much weight with advertisers. If the heart of the seasoned ticket holder were capable of being stirred by the rapt words of poets, we should see our modern editors scaling Parnassus with checkbooks in their hands, in search of the blithe singers they now successfully avoid. With smiles and courteous phrases on their lips, they would ply Pegasus with ingenious dopes of flattery to rouse him to record-breaking flights. The soft titles of poems would contend on the bills with the names of criminals and correspondents. We should have the poet's criticism of the cup-tie final, and the boat race, and tariff reform. We should hear how he wrote his poems, and what he had for his breakfast. His photograph would figure in the advertisement columns, and he would tell us how he cleaned his teeth and where he bought his rouge. In brief, he would be famous. But as a matter of fact, the season ticket holder does not care a rap for poetry, and the judicious editor is at pains to imitate him. Only, since a newspaper must be cultured, he every now and then allows one of his young men to deal with a score of little volumes in a column-headed recent verse, and it says something for the present-day journalist that frequently the column is very well written. With the editor, 
in nine cases out of ten a commercial man endeavoring more or less successfully to interpret the wishes of his customers i shall have no further concern but the case of the average englishman is more interesting how is it that he a creature of flesh and blood eating and drinking and loving and breathing good air does not care to see his life expressed in its highest emotional terms i am prepared to meet the objection that to-day we have no outstanding poet to win the favor of the majority of the semi-cultured for in the past the middle classes have been content to elect their own gods they preferred byron and walter scott to keats and shelley and tennyson and coventry patmore at their worst to browning and mr swinburne i think it may be said that we have not discovered a keats or a browning among our living poets but i feel sure that only encouragement is needed to produce a very good substitute for the byron of child harold or the tennyson of the may queen but it is just this encouragement that is lacking it is not that the general taste in poetry has improved it has rather died a natural death so that a poet is put to all manner of shifts to win a hearing a friend of mine has solved the problem by visiting coffee stalls in the little hours of the morning and giving cake and coffee to the unemployed on condition that they listen to his sonnets i would rather read a sonnet to a body of loafers than to the occupants of a second-class carriage in a suburban morning train and in this preference there lies the heart of the present problem it is the middle-class intellectual who has deserted the parnassian colors it is his defection that has made it impossible for a poet to earn a living wage and it is not difficult to see why he has done so when he meets his neighbor in the morning he talks critically about the weather at midday his view of the weather becomes introspective at night prophetic he is a kind of inexact barometer if he be a pessimist he welcomes the sunshine that interrupts the rain if an optimist he deplores the rain that interrupts the sunshine but life for him is always a matter of weather now and it is failure to realize this that has made poets what they are an englishman talks about the weather because he is afraid to talk about anything else he feels that in all other topics there lurk vague perils to admire scenery is affected sociology is coarse the drama vulgar politics violent religious discussion blasphemous and so on but to remark that we really do have extraordinary weather in england is at once good citizenship and sound imperialism therefore the poet when he does happen to reach the ears of the lords of middle-class homes annoys them very much by his un-english lack of reticence as every tradesman knows there is a fortune for any one who can please the great middle classes and as in a dream i can see a race of poets springing up and waxing fat by means of their subtle power of expressing the real emotions of the backbone of england they will make epics of wind and rain and sudden hail or in lighter mood they will weave ballads of fog and triolets of mud their works will be largely quoted in the suburbs and on the platforms of railway stations and as literature will form part of the curriculum of private schools to know them will be a sign of culture and to own the weather anthologies will stamp a man as an intellectual once more so my dream runs ecstatically poetry other than limericks will be good form provided always that the poet observes his anticyclones and keeps a wise eye on his depressions poets will have harems and motor-cars and nice things to eat and drink and their poetry will not suffer for even now the finer luxuries of the rich are the mere necessaries of poets the poet laureate will have a larger income than any of the able office boys who form governments by virtue of his rank he will be able to go to pantomimes and music halls without paying for his seat or his program and bus conductors will know him by sight he will form one of the select group of great men who answer the conundrums of the day the times will print his verses of course this is only a beautiful dream a dream too beautiful to develop into a concrete fact and it must be recognized that the responsibility for the present neglect of poetry lies chiefly in an age that loves the word efficiency 
with the poets themselves. Writing once before upon this matter, I put forward the perfectly reasonable suggestion that poets should have their poems sold in the streets at a penny each. This would manifestly be good for the poets and also for the happy English homes that gained their songs. But I only succeeded in drawing a correspondent who accused me of encouraging, quote, shrieking versifiers, unquote. I utterly mistrust the poet who does not want everybody to read his poems, just as I utterly mistrust the poet who prates about the dignity of poverty and does not want lots of money to spend. An artist without vanity is like a rocket without a stick, and a poet who does not long for every kind of emotional excess is a coward. To live happily in an attic nowadays, when money can buy so many different kinds of roses, is the sign of a deficient imagination. It is true that the poet's strength lies in his dreams, but he can always start dreaming where life leaves off. If he has a motor, he will desire wings. If he has an airship, he will long to sail through the passionless seas of space. You cannot weary a man of nectarines by giving him apples. And now, after, I fear, an excess of errant flippancy, I come to my point. Poets must be supported by the state and handsomely supported in order that they may cultivate their bittersweet disease to advantage. I calculate that the cost of one dreadnought would provide an annual sum sufficient to keep twenty poets from emotional starvation. Probably, since England is what it is, they will have to be chosen by competitive examination. But, once chosen, they must have complete liberty to waste their lives as they will. Probably three-quarters of them will thereafter be content to lead pretty lives and write no more. Possibly the others will turn out a few decent lyrics. But the moral effect of state recognition of the value of poetry will be enormous. For the moment the middle classes discover that there is money in poetry, they will respect poets and buy their works and their portraits. Surely this desirable end were cheaply attained at the cost of one battleship. End of section 7《セクション8》of monologues。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Monologues by Richard Middleton. Pensions for poets. A few weeks ago, I wrote an article in which I suggested the wholesale pensioning of English poets. I stated my case flippantly for the reader's sake, but I had quite a serious purpose of my own. I think poets. Or, for that matter, any one who devotes his life to the unremunerated production of beautiful things should be handsomely supported by the state. We reward persons who make oilcloth and umbrellas and things of that sort. We supply policemen to take care of their houses and dreadnoughts to defend their factories. We put crests on their spoons and let them adopt names of pleasant English villages in place of their own. We even create bishops in case the souls of manufacturers should have been injured by their own machines. But for the poets, who are really the designers of the umbrellas and oilcloths of tomorrow, we do nothing whatever. They have no homes or factories or spoons, and their souls are beyond the reach of bishops. The expensive little systems that guard our conventions are merely tiresome limitations to them. All that we can give them is the gold that they alone know how to spend. And this we withhold. I feel a certain diffidence in approaching the presumed suicide of John Davidson, partly because nearly everyone else who has written about it has annoyed me, and partly because I cannot quite understand his motive. It has been assumed generally that the immediate cause of his suicide was lack of money, and one might deduce from his last letter that for another hundred or two a year he would have been willing to continue living and writing poetry. There is something significant in the Wordsworthian simplicity of that ideal dinner that he designed before leaving home for the last time. Potato soup, boiled beef, and rice pudding are all good things in their way. But the combination is the meal of a feeder rather than an eater. I can find a certain dignity in the man who rejects life because it holds for him no truffles or April strawberries. But, in all sympathy... It is ridiculous to commit suicide because one cannot have enough rice pudding. Poets kill themselves because they have not got ten thousand a year with which to exhaust the emotional possibilities of concrete pleasure. No one would voluntarily cease from living for lack of a plateful of potato soup. 
and it was this consideration that made me smile at mr william watson's passionately sympathetic letter to the times england does starve her poets but on the whole it is better that she should do so than that she should make them a pauper's allowance of boiled beef and rice pudding it was chatterton's stricken vanity and not his hunger that made him hurry so and i feel that the same might also be said of davidson he was one of those unfortunate people who believe that they have a message to convey to the world forgetting perhaps that it is impossible to convey messages to a stomach the bitterness of the unhonored prophet is cumulative and in the end his message smashed by john davidson if it had been the ordinary man with an idea in his head or in polite english with a bee in his bonnet we should have heard little about it but it happened that he was also a poet and rather a big poet so all the little newspapers danced on his body and the constant readers asked why he did not try to earn an honest living when he found that poetry did not pay there is no need to answer such asses they shall burn in any hell of mine until they are weary of pain itself for the rest it may well be that the prophet davidson grew weary of waiting for the tardy ravens but it is certain that the poet the man who wrote the ballad of a nun and the runnable stag did not kill himself for lack of an extra hundred a year nor indeed is he dead the case of john davidson has reminded the journals of today that poets may have a kind of sentimental value and that it may be creditable in a country to save her singers from starving but in discussing the question of state support they admit sensibly enough that no officially appointed body could be trusted to distinguish the sheep from the goats the singers from the amiable persons who ought to write prose the tests any such body would apply would be the kind of tests that govern the admission of strange young men to suburban drawing-rooms and we should end by having twenty poet laureates where now we suffer but one while the ernest dowsons and francis thompsons would continue to inherit the gutters of london this is so certain i cannot blame the leader writers for shelving the problem until the next young poet makes himself into a rondeau with strychnine or blows his brains into a rosy lyric nor do i think it matters for i do not believe that two hundred and fifty a year would do any poet any good and i doubt whether the present age is sufficiently enlightened to pay its poets more such an income represents compromise and compromise is bad for poets there is a type of poet that can do very good work in prisons and doss houses there is another type that wants to pelt expensive actresses to death with orchids and drive over cliffs in amber motor cars and between these two ideals of spiritual and physical asceticism there lies respectability and the whole tragedy of modern english poetry i suppose wordsworth and tennyson and browning have something to answer for but when i see most of our modern young poets i long to make them drunk on methylated spirits they are so neat and tame and pretty they would find shelley odd and burns coarse and villon would pick their pockets there is no need to provide pensions for young men like these they can always fall back on the more dashing kind of journalism as for the others an illimitable optimism is needed to believe that any government would give ten thousand a year to a disreputable person merely because he had a gift of song yet this is what we must do if we are going to concern ourselves with the worldly welfare of poets at all i am not so much concerned with the possible effect of this living wage on their work though one may be permitted to wonder what shakespeare or burns or even stevenson would have written if they had been really well to do what charms me is the thought of how delightfully the poets would spend the money they would not as most rich men do so order their scale of living that they hardly had a penny for those inessential extravagances that are essential to children and the elderly wise nor if they were the right sort of poet would they wholly forget the coffee stalls of bohemia in the wine cups of utopia though i trust they would forget the coffee and their dreams 
It is really pitiful to reflect what a lot of time our poets waste in dreaming that they have motor cars and yachts and music halls of their own, when the possession of these trifles would enable them to solve the riddle of the universe in a lifetime or so. Our poets have always been underfed, and, in consequence, they have given us a great account of life, like the hungry boy who flattens his nose on the cookshop window and thinks nobly of sausages. A generation of fat poets would alter all of that, and perhaps would shake our state of material contentment. Today we are so sure of ourselves that we are prepared to classify miracles as they occur. I can imagine someone running from the bed of Lazarus to a present-day drawing room with the news that a man had just been raised from the dead. The twentieth century would comment, Oh, in America, I suppose. And Lazarus would creep gladly back into his grave. The satisfied are damned because they need no faith, and nowadays in this sense nearly everybody is satisfied. But realizing the power of money, I think that a man who was once a poet and rich might contrive a miracle or two to set the idiots gaping, as healthy idiots should gape at this nightmare of a world. I suppose this theory as to the function of poets would be called far-fetched though I doubt whether I should secure belief if I said how far I had fetched it. But the poets themselves must be blamed if their attitude towards life is misunderstood. Once it may have been natural for poets to demand flowers and love and things of that sort. Now the true lover of nature is the man who wants ten thousand a year to spend on the concrete illustration of his dreams. Poets must claim this, not as charity, but as a right. And if they do not secure it, they have only to cease writing. Perhaps in a few centuries, they will have their revenge. End of section 8、section、nine of Monologues. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Monologues by Richard Middleton. How to be a poet. Mr. William Watson's recent timely remonstrance against the use of the term minor poet raises the question of the complete ignorance of the general public as to what constitutes a poet. Of course, there is no such thing as a minor poet. It were as sensible to talk of minor dipsomaniacs or minor consumptives. A man either has the will to express himself lyrically or he has it not. If he is smitten with this bittersweet disease, he is a poet. If he has escaped it, he is just a something in a poet's background, a something that will turn to dust and then to daisies to sway deliciously in the wind because. Long ago, some poet loved, or more likely thought he loved, a girl who bore the name of that flower. For even while the minor critics are perfecting delicately offensive phrases with which to express their contempt for those who serve the muses, the poets are changing the venom and filth of those very critics into spring flowers and sunsets and beautiful, hopeful things. Perhaps it is a subconscious sense of this magic metamorphosis that makes little critics so harsh with poets. When a child is born to this earth, it opens its lips and weeps lustily, and yet there are persons who would deny that very young children have the gift of insight. As the days and the months and the years pass by, it is bribed into the habit of living by means of sops and trifles. When it tears incommode its neighbors, it is given sweets to hush it. When its play is too noisy, it is punished into silence. So in time it learns the great rule of compromise, and if it is a healthy normal child, it dies at threescore years and ten, without ever having laughed so loudly as to awaken jealousy in its fellows, without ever having wept so long as to imply a criticism of the wisdom of the methods of God. Whether its existence has made any difference is a problem for those scientists who can weigh dirt to a billionth part of a grain. But now and again there is born a child whose tears may not be stayed with sweets, 
whose laughter triumphs over chastisement walking a little aloof singing and laughing and weeping it troubles the great silence that lulls the hearts of men it flouts the idol that its fathers have served for generations it worships a wind-torn poppy that only a reaper's whim has spared while other children grow more and more akin about it every day seems to set this child farther from its neighbors every day it grows more like the flowers and winds and the trees of the world and so while the children of civilization grow old and pass it stays among the hills and silent places and does not die on the world of men and women into which it would seem to have wandered by mistake its influence might be ignored and yet for centuries the young man shall woo the maidens with the love and the song that it gave the world and the maidens themselves shall have wide eyes and crimson lips because it was so that the wonder child liked them to be of such children are the poets to divide humanity into groups and put each group to bed with a sweeping generalization is a popular but dangerous amusement and especially is it deadly to provide verbal paramours for the group of splendid accidents we call poets in the first place it is not easy to say what a poet is i suppose most definitions would imply in some way or other that he is a writer of poems but even here there is a doubt the desire for expression exists in so many different degrees for instance edward fitzgerald was satisfied with the compliments of a small circle of intimate friends while poor john davidson wished a nation to accept his truth i can conceive a man devoting his whole life to the effort to express himself lyrically to one person a woman perhaps what a fine thing it would be for a poet to pass his hours in writing the eternal song on the heart of a girl and what a fine girl it seems ridiculous to suppose that if shelley had never learnt how to write he would not have been a poet yet if we admit that a poet need not write poems we must also allow that nearly every one is at times a poet and so in a sense nearly every one is i heard a story the other day of a little london child who was taken out to the country for the first time and sat down in a field to play she looked about her in a dazed way at the green fields and hedges and then was physically sick if that child had possessed the gift of verbal expression she would have written a poem but even so i doubt whether she could have paid nature a finer compliment than this i have noticed that in moments of great sorrow the uneducated achieve a singular dignity and felicity of phrase and it is reasonable to suppose that it is their ignorance of craftsmanship rather than any lack of emotional force that prevents them from expressing themselves lyrically in spite of our stultifying civilization there are a few superlative moments in the lives of every one which only failure to acquire the habit of writing verse prevents them from expressing in poetry but apart from the joy of believing that there are possibilities for good in every one it must be acknowledged that this latent poet is so firmly suppressed in the bosoms of the respectable that he might almost as well not be there at all and we are therefore justified in demanding that to earn the title of poet a man should write poems beyond this the adjudgment of poets always seems to me a question of how far the individual poets have succeeded in expressing the ego of the critic thus i probably think far too much of dawson because he wrote sainara a poem however which only the maddest of prigs could call minor and similarly while i own to loving francis thompson for his poems about children it is a poem called memorat memoria that takes my breath away because i am one of the very unfortunate persons who really know what it means yet i know both dawson and thompson did much better work than this this is the difficulty this conflict between the emotional and the intellectual judgments that must always trouble critics who endeavor to divide poets into classes 
saving always those godlike critics who own to no emotions and may therefore be safely permitted to bore each other till newspapers cease to appear it is not always the so-called great poets who knock us off our intellectual perches there lies beside me a little volume of poems published exactly fifty years ago by thomas ash a name that till i looked between the covers bore for me only the dimmest significance yet there are surprisingly beautiful things in that little book and i think a modern poet could make a reputation in this untuneful age by reproducing his curiously individual music critics of poetry are nearly useless because their blood save by rare coincidence can never run the course of yours or mine and now i suppose the time has come to justify a title carefully calculated to strike the thoughtless as impertinent for while i should hesitate before giving advice to would-be engine drivers the question i have undertaken to answer seems to me an easy one take something i would say to the young man desirous of parnassus take anything and love it and thereafter if he were a child of his century i should have to tell him of love the rude uncivilized force that has inspired all the deeds worth doing that has made all things worth making i should tell him that it was nonsense to speak of anything or anybody being worthy of his love that the question is whether he could make his love worthy of any shadow of an idea that might penetrate his education i should tell him uh, to what end that he might see life as he would have made it and weep his years away that he might find beauty and fail to win it that he might cry his scorn of ugliness on the hills and have never a hearer for his pains pooh it were kinder to let him snore with the others there are too many unhappy people already end of section nine section ten of monologues this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org monologues by richard middleton traitors of art probably everyone remembers swift's famous essay on a broomstick but it is to be feared that this which was thought a masterpiece of ingenious fancy in its time would pass unnoticed in these sophisticated days for nowadays everybody writes about broomsticks and indeed the writer who does not do so is in danger of failing in that final task of belly filling that relates the artist inevitably to the man in other words specialization the art of losing the infinite in search of the finite has become the only art that the brute many who hold the golden pieces deem worthy of reward treated in this way the eternal things that thrilled and troubled our fathers become manageable and duly subservient to the popular will it is difficult to patronize death but easy to prattle of cremation and curious epitaphs love resisting the steady pressure of civilizing forces remains unmoral but we have invented a definite morality for marriage and it serves nor have we spared such semi-concrete things as the stars in the blue sky we have weighed the atmosphere and measured the stars setting limits to their wonder and it would take a week-long eclipse of the sun to shake our reliance on the astronomers observing that the passion for specialization and the specialist is regarded in england as tending to efficiency it is hardly necessary to add that it is insane the wholly efficient man if he exists anywhere which god forbid is certainly insane for a man's soul lies neither in his strength nor his weakness but balanced fitly between the two like a ball in the hands of a child a man without strength is an idiot but a man without weakness would be a god in an asylum in terms of life 
a specialist might be defined as a person of unusually widespread ignorance but his tragedy really lies in the fact that his absorption in one subject inevitably prevents him from knowing anything about that subject thus to take simple illustrations a bibliophile is a man who knows nothing about books an astronomer is a man who cannot see the stars a botanist is a man for whom the earth provides no flowers and yet it is such folk that our modern simplicity would have us go for information concentration even though it may be a lifelong can only give a man knowledge of inessential things truth can only be won from those inspired moments that build up eternity i suppose it is a too thorough acceptance of the doctrine of free will that has led us to confuse a knowledge of facts with the realization of truth we feel that if we learn all there is to be known about a thing the truth must be ours though our very knowledge is likely to make it obscure a man may concentrate all his faculties on an abandoned pump for thirty years before a little dog with a flash of intuition shows him how it can be made useful the knowledge that we deliberately seek is rarely of any value wisdom lies in the appreciation of the significance of the accidental all this seems perhaps a little remote from literature but its application to the present state of english art is only too exact at no period of english literature have our authors been so greatly confused by what are pessimistically designated the facts of life these may be divided into such natural phenomena as cold and hunger and such generally lauded conventions as cleanliness and education and their effect on the minds of our writers has been to make them minor prophets and great bores thus the person who ought to be gratifying our taste for trilets and fairy stories think it their duty to produce didactic plays and novels from which one would judge that the first task of man is rather to improve his neighbor than himself the weakness of propagandist art lies in the fact that his message leads the author to pay too much attention to the whims and prejudices of his readers it was possibly necessary that the english people should be reminded of the facts that are the foundation of mrs warren's profession but in order to bring them home to his audience the author has spoiled his play mr shaw is a good or if you prefer it a bad example of the artistic martyrdoms that will make the present literary period notorious one of these days he has sold his soul to the conscience for a mess of unconventional morality certainly he does not credit the facts of which he is indeed the slave but this dissatisfaction with the purely honourable task of creating beautiful things is in the air it can hardly be dismissed with a phrase it is expressed with considerable force in the latest novel of mr john masefield who has written fine poetry before now it has damned mr h g wells soured mr john galsworthy and made mr chesterton frequently tiresome it has killed davidson and afflicted us with this city of dreadful brass from the hand that wrote sussex only time will tell us what its influence may be on the younger men but to me the serious aspect of this scepticism as to the honesty of the artistic ideal is that it has made most of our men of letters traitors to their cause i suppose that at all times there have been persons a great many persons who thought that the lives of artists were useless but it has remained for the artists of the day to say as much themselves how can we hope to succeed in our task of teaching the men and women and children of england to appreciate the beautiful if we commence with the admission that beauty does not count the so-called decadence of another age were skilled to find roses in the mud we with our more wholesome utilitarian outlook are eager to find mud in every rose in order to bring the blunders of civilization home to the minds of the civilized lord curzon once told a grateful audience 
that there was no reason why england should feel depressed but to those of us who believe that shakespeare keats and swinburne have done more for their country than nelson wellington and gladstone it matters little whether england is sorry because there are yet worthless things to which she cannot attain or proud of the worthless things to which she has attained but that those men who ought to be the leaders in the camp of truth should encourage her in her esteem of inessentials that they should speak to her of the little passing diseases that they dread when love is out in the world and the great salt winds are beating in from the sea that is the last treachery i will give an illustration i suppose if these people have not written in vain that the embankment has become to be considered a kind of rallying ground for nocturnal misery a place where vice and misfortune rub shoulders and wait for the bowls of soup as a matter of fact the embankment by night is the finest thing in all london and in some measures london's justification i had always appreciated the sombre beauty of the river with its shadows and reflections but it was a poet of my acquaintance who first pointed out to me the exquisite tracery of the shadows thrown by the branches of the plain trees on the grey pavements given a slight breeze to set the branches swaying there can be nothing more beautiful than this in the whole round world now i confess that i have not conquered my natural aversions for all forms of human discomfort whether exemplified in my own body or in those of other people but let me add that in the face of that lovely changing tapestry these brief sorrows or even these brief lives seem to me of small importance we are born to starve and shiver for a while in the gutters of life and presently we die but beauty is eternal and it is only by our means of appreciation of beauty that we can bear with our clumsy rotting bodies while our lives last all other creeds seem to me forlorn and self-destructive and to the young man for whom i write since the follies of age extend to the grave i would commend those delicate shadows on the stones of the embankment as given this sordid city life a certain eternal significance doubtless the loathsome details of that life threaten to choke them as they seem to have choked most of our older artists but while god is content to spread his beauty beneath our feet as he spread it beneath the feet of shakespeare of keats and of swinburne there is hope for those of us who can see it end of section ten section eleven of monologues this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org monologues by richard middleton suicide and the state in the shropshire lad by mr a e houseman a poet who alone among his loquacious kind sings too little there is a curious expression of opinion on one might almost say defense of suicide i have not the book by me and i admire mr houseman too much to rewrite his poem from memory but i hope that readers will know their shropshire lad too well to need more than a reference to the poem to recall it to their memories a young man who has become troublesome to his neighbors and worst of all troublesome to himself has closed his brief history with a bullet well done lad says the poet that was brave now i'm sufficiently the slave of an age i hate to feel a certain timidity in approaching the subject of suicide or self-murder as fat people prefer to call it it is a thing that the normal however broad-minded they may be do not like to discuss for of all destructive criticism of life this is the most weighty other criminals murderers thieves and the like we can punish or even forgive because we know that each one of us under unfavorable conditions might commit murder or theft opportunity alone makes the upright man but a suicide does more than attack our persons or our pockets 
he injures our self-complacency and murders our vanity we can forgive a man for booing or creating a disturbance in the theatre of life but we cannot forgive him for going out with a yawn before the play is over in effect he says i find your society dull and your follies do not amuse me you are a lot of tiresome fellows and the devil of the business is that if the rascal is successful we cannot punish him for the impertinence we can and i believe sometimes do send people to prison for failing to kill themselves in order that they may there acquire a fuller appreciation of their fellow human beings but with all our wisdom we have as yet no certain means of chastening the untimely dead like the mythical woman the suicides always have the last word in the argument and while we condemn their folly we have the uncomfortable conviction that they cannot hear us of course it is impossible for any person breathing air and holding the flowers of the world for his reward to defend suicide but it is another thing to suggest by our silence that suicides do not exist we believe no man to be wary of life until he has pulled the trigger or emptied the cup when he is dead a jury of british tradesmen breathe the word insanity for epitaph over his body and then go home to dinner without any troublesome doubts as to the value of life yet every honest man knows that nineteen suicides out of twenty are perfectly sane the majority lives for what life gives it the minority dies for what life withholds and while for once in a way it is possible to agree with the majority it must be admitted that the point of view of the minority is not irrational it is pessimism rather than wisdom that keeps us alive it is optimism and not madness that leads the suicides to seek for better things in the grave but it is once admitted that many of the individuals who commit suicide are not only sane but even possessed of considerable intellectual gifts it seems natural to ask whether their lives might not be expanded usefully in the service of humanity instead of being merely abandoned in dark corners at present it is poor civilization's only revenge a certain stigma attaches to the family of a person who has committed suicide but if instead of being posthumously dubbed insane or criminal a man were said to have devoted his life to the state we might come to feel rather proud of these unhappy critics let us put aside all our beloved nonsense about the sacredness of human life leaving the extravagant waste of war out of the question every railway journey every ton of coal and every unit of electricity costs a fraction of a man's life we achieve a greater degree of comfort by our cunning but the colliery the railway line and the dynamo all take their toll in accidents and part of the wages of the men we pay to work them is a greater risk of death than we run who are content to use them considerations for the life of individuals has never been allowed to interfere with the convenience of the many yet i can conceive the outcry of the coal-burning railway-using sentimentalists against the foundation of a state department for the useful expenditure of the lives of those persons who are wary of an existence that it is hardly credible to endure but imagine the simplicity of the scheme there will be an office in london which would-be suicides would seek in place of the gunmaker's shop or the river thence after filling up a form they would be drafted to an establishment in which they would be maintained at government expense and after a week of probation they would become officially dead once there they would be beyond the reach of the law and their wives would be free to marry again while in cases of destitution provision would be made for the families they had left behind them the living bodies of these dead men would then be at surface of the state they would be available for the doctors in place of dogs and monkeys for experimental germ reading and vivisection they could test high explosives and conduct dangerous chemical operations 
in time of war, they would man steerable torpedoes, or dynamite-laden aeroplanes. In fact, they could be used in any work that involved great risk of life. They would, of course, be prisoners. But it is no part of my scheme that they should be hurried into the next world by means of the ordinary prison diet. Perhaps a maximum limit would be put to their existence at the option of individual patients. But their very death might be made medically useful. All this sounds possibly a little inhuman, but it is really only a question of facing facts. You cannot persuade a person who has found out life to continue living by giving him tracts. Personally, I should have more sympathy with suicides if they killed themselves when they were very, very happy in order to avoid anticlimax. But it must be realized that there is a minority, a minority that are growing skepticism will materially increase, that finds life an intolerably tiresome business. The simplest study of the epistolary literature left behind by these persons will convince anyone that they are, as a class, the vainest of creatures, and this vanity could hardly fail to be attracted by the scheme I have outlined above. It is of no use to say that people ought not to kill themselves. They will do it, and this being so, we may as well make their whim as valuable to the bulk of humanity as possible. End of section 11「Section 12 of Monologues. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Monologues by Richard Middleton. The Age of Disenchantment. Let me start by saying that my title does not refer to that delicate period in the life of a human being, at which the illusions of childhood, the appealing and comfortable faith in one's elders, the belief in the beneficent care of machine-made gods fall away and are no more, and earth, vast, unknown, yet still strangely alluring, yawns before the feet of adventurous youth. For one thing, the disillusionment is never complete. The childish illusions fade, but no less visionary and delightful illusions of youth take their place, and so to our graves. But while it falls to no individual man or woman to see things as they are, or perhaps I should say, to find that things are not, it is possible for groups of men and women, for cities, races, and nations, to achieve this morbid insight. The units that compose the faithless, rebellious whole continue to soothe their bruised souls with the eternal legends hope and faith and love they say are of the soul of man and set him definitely apart from the lower animals who hope and love and worship around him and for these universal qualities he will ultimately receive a glorious and a special reward so they comfort the moment's tears and he would be cruel indeed who should seek to deny them this weak solace for the pain of living. But, oddly, the faith of a nation seems to have no part in these personal and enduring beliefs. It appears rather to be the sum of those somber, unshapen doubts that no man dares to express. Today, in England, it would be impossible to find a human being who did not believe in some theory, some idea, some miracle, in support of which his reason could produce no evidence. It is equally impossible to discover that, as a nation, we believe in anything whatever. We have outworn the faith of our fathers, and our eyes can discover no star to guide us anew. The age of disenchantment is now. Where should we seek to find the soul of a nation most clearly expressed? First, of course, in its literature, and, above all, in its poetry, though we must remember that it is always the second-rate work that shows the closest connection with the age that produces it, genius knowing no time and representing no age in particular. Secondly, I think, in its politicians, who aspire to and achieve a fine honesty of mediocrity. 
lastly in the lives and speech of the people in general and in the newspapers which represent faithfully enough the interests and desires of the uneducated classes it will perhaps be convenient if i consider these expressions of our national impulses one at a time and first and most sadly as to our literature to my mind there is no more striking token of our national disenchantment than the abandonment by our artist of the belief in beauty for beauty's sake this when essentials are considered was the faith of milton and shakespeare or to come nearer to our own days of keats and robert browning and swinburne among the representative writers of our time it has been abandoned as passionately as our predecessors sought to express it and what has taken its place no doubt it may be said that mr shaw and mr kipling and mr wells have a personal faith no man can live as near space as we do without some protecting screen of belief but under what banner of enchantment do these writers make their appeal to what echo in the heart of man do they cry for an answer to me mr kipling recalls the consuming folly of the first half of the south african war and mr bernard shaw the shamed cowardice of the second half of that luckless victory their messages are alike contemptuous but mr shaw despises his audience more than mr kipling and gives them more careful work mr wells is more truly representative of his day than they are possibly because as an artist he is inferior to either of them his message is the point and cry of a race that can win to no belief yesterday a fabian today a liberal tomorrow a tory he is inspired by a faintly ecstatic distaste of life and ridden hard by a conscience in which he does not believe his view of things is negative i could set down fifty things that he dislikes i do not know one thing that he appreciates he has found out life but he has not found heaven he is the artist of disenchantment the wells at which no man can quench his thirst i have taken these three writers i should add by the way that mr kipling once was enchanted because they stand for modern literary tendencies but the case of our young poets is even sadder and more to the point we have none when i come to the politicians the bitter ink in my fountain pen turns to honey for i am very sorry for them even more sorry than they are for themselves their case is more simple than that of artists for artists are always exceptional men whereas politics demands of her children that save in rare instances they should be fiercely commonplace the hardness of their lot lies in this that although they represent with passionate honesty the views and faltering ambitions of ordinary men no one will believe in them and under pressure of circumstances they no longer believe in themselves to a certain extent no doubt this is due to the party system the delicate invention that commands a man who dislikes chinese labor to believe in the nationalization of land and a man who mistrusts home rule for ireland to accept tariff reform but chiefly it is due to the spirit of the age the spirit that holds that all things are bad that no act of ours can make them better and that it is our duty to spend our lives in the attempt we elect our representatives and then turn our faces to the wall in the mournful belief that after all they do not represent us and when the time comes it takes all the screaming elegance of the newspapers to convince us that a crisis is at hand then we vote again and once more return shrugging to our uneasy slumbers politicians today are the interrogation marks the nation sets in the book of destiny it is our doubts that return members of parliament they are living symbols of our lack of belief in the utility of man's endeavors and lastly we come to the people themselves the stuff that fills our houses and streets and overflows into our gutters to me their state of disenchantment is pitiful they flee death and praise it they seek pleasure and condemn it they demand beauty and kill it no cynicism is too wild for their lips no act of fanatical tyranny too harsh for their hearts it's not that they outrage literature with a pair of 
Northcliffe scissors it is not that they pay journalists to tell them lies they do not intend to believe it is not even that they are ceasing to go to the churches though all these things are true but they are forgetting how to love and how to hate and this is the measure of their unemotional decadence behind their callous simulations of passion lies hidden the calculating cowardice of the financier in the same way that behind their definitions of honor there lurks the swelling mobsman who fears the cudgel of honest men love is degraded to the registry office in more than word hatred in itself an affirmation of good is recognized as unprofitable with the policeman waiting round the corner a cold scepticism is burning the hearts of men and women to ashes of that desire that painted the trees green and the lips of women red and set the stars moving over all we are disenchanted end of section twelve